الأسرة الشريهان كريستينا نورهان وديراندا الكبيرة Photos that are a reminder of happier times for Hassan Wahid, a Syrian doctor of Kurdish origin who fled from his home country. In 2013, in danger when war broke out in Syria, he decided to board a fishing boat with his wife and four daughters in Libya in order to cross the Mediterranean. On board, I was separated from my family. The smugglers had the men and older boys gathered by the stern and in the hold while women and children were by the bow. So I didn't see my daughters during the whole journey. After a few hours at sea, the boat was attacked by an armed gang of Libyans. Just after they shot at our boats, it started taking water. People tried to climb up to the deck and the boat began losing its balance. The boat was taking on water for several hours and finally capsized with nearly 480 people on board. I clung to the dead body of a woman wearing a life jacket. I was shouting my wife's name, Manal, and calling out for my daughters, where are you? I was screaming out for help. Hassan's wife survived, but the couple lost their four daughters in the shipwreck. Today, he's accusing the Italian maritime authorities of delaying their response to the emergency calls. Our first SOS call was at midday, and the boat capsized at 5 p.m., so that's five hours later. For me, that's intentional, cold-blooded murder. It's simply not possible to deny assistance to people who've been begging for your help for hours. It's a crime. For five years, the Italian justice system refused to accept this version of the event until the Italian press revealed the recordings of the emergency calls from the migrants to the Italian Coast Guard office. Hello? Yes. These are some of the excerpts. Yes. About 100 children and 100 women and the boat is going down. Yes. I swear to you, there about half liter water in, in, it, in, the, in the boat. Water is coming into it. Please hurry, please hurry. Sir. Repeat your position. North, 34. 38 minutes later, another call from the boat to Italy. Hello? Hello? Please, Hello. you send anyone for us? We are the Syrians, about 300. Sir, uh, I give you the number of Malta Authority because you are near Malta. You are near Malta. And yet, the investigation revealed the GPS position of the boat. They were closer to the Italian island of Lampedusa. 31 minutes later... I call Malta. They said that we are near to Lampedusa more than Malta. I give position. You are the, you are the prostitute for us. We are dying, please. <laughs> OK, you are... You are uh, we are dying. Don't do us. Call Malta, call Malta. I, I have no enough account in the mobile if you cut, please. Yes, you have to call Malta, sir. You have to call Malta. Four and a half hours after their first call, the boat sinks. And yet, there is still no sign of rescue services. Fabrizio Gatti was the first journalist to start investigating into who was responsible for this calamity. His investigation revealed that an Italian military vessel was in the zone of the shipwreck at just 17 nautical miles from the migrant boat. Sarebbe potuta arrivare in circa un'ora. They could have got there within an hour. Questa è la differenza di tempo. That's the time gap that stopped these people from being saved. The two officials in the dock, one from the Italian Navy and the other from the Coast Guard service, risk up to 15 years in prison for negligent homicide. As part of their defense, they accuse the island of Malta of badly coordinating the rescue operation. The Maltese authorities created confusion amongst the Italian authorities. When a member state of the European Union takes control of operations and the incident takes place in their territorial waters, one expects them to intervene. About 20 families of victims are civil parties in this trial. Some of them will stand as witnesses in the court in Rome. They have a right to justice. 
They have a right to hear the truth, to understand why they weren't rescued in time, why the accused at the centre of this case conducted themselves with such indifferent to the life of others. Ever since the catastrophe, Hassan struggles with guilt and remorse. I wish I had died in their place. Ever since then, I've been praying to my daughters, asking them to forgive me. I implore their forgiveness, because I'm the one who made them take this journey. Today, Hassan lives in Switzerland with his wife. He hopes the trial will help him find some peace of mind and allow him, at last, to grieve for his daughters.